Hello, everybody. Um, we are. It's a pleasure for me to introduce today to our second uh, plenary speaker, Professor Roland Green. Before I proceed, I must remind you that there will be no questions at the end, keeping in with the custom of our society. When postpatriarchism, origins and innovations of the Western lyric sequence was published in 1991, our reviewer approvingly commented how this book escaped many of the gatekeeping concepts and relationships that dominate discussions of Renaissance as well as modern and postmodern lyric sequences. At a time when comparative endeavors seemed to be out of fashion, this book opened a path for those interested in diachronic and transnational approaches to lyric. If I may so, this is a personal fruit of mine because it has shaped how I approach the Petrarchan lyric sequence in Spain. This path, opened by post-patriarchism, was further widened with its follow-up publication, Unrequited Conquest, Love and Empire in the Colonial Americas, a book that, that I'm sure that it's very dear to many of us present here today. In this book, Green argued that the transatlantic popularity of patriarchism in the early modern period responded to its emphasis on unrequitedness as a vehicle for imperial aspirations. His last monograph, Five Words, Critical Semantics in the Age of Shakespeare and Cervantes, a daring exploration of old texts and new methods, was equally received to critical acclaim. This influence has been felt here at Cambridge, if I may say so. Uh, <clears throat> to give an example, Christy Hong, in his forthcoming Rutledge Companion to Early Modern Spanish Literature and Culture, and edited with Caroline Negan, our own Rodrigo Gacho has decided to organize the structure of this text um, around keywords in the wake of Green's critical semantics. It is fair to assume that his current book project, Apollo Barroco, will follow the steps of its previous works. Professor Green, who holds three named chairs at Stanford University, no more, no less, <laughs> he is the Mark Pigot Knight of the British Empire, professor in the School of the Humanities and Sciences, a quite appropriate title for the current location we're here today. The Anthony P. Meyer Family Professor in the Humanities, as well as the Professor of English and Comparative Literature and by courtesy of Iberian and Latin American cultures. Professor Green, as I was saying, is without doubt one of the foremost comparativists of our day. It is therefore only appropriate the distinguished scholar, not only of his caliber, but also one who has paid such extensive attention to <coughs> transatlantic literary streams throughout his career, should deliver the next plenary lecture of our conference, Global Ecos. Taking his cue from the title of the conference, Professor Green will talk to us today about the walls of transatlantic poetry. So please join me in giving Roland Green a warm welcome today. Thank you, Carlos. I'm uh, honored by that introduction and also by the invitation to speak to you uh, and to join you for the conference. Um, as he mentioned, I am, I'm a comparatist, not a hispanist, and I think my performance in the pub quiz last night <laughs> demonstrated that <laughs> fact. Um, but I have heard so many wonderful panels in the last couple of days and learned so much from many of you, so I want to thank you for the opportunity to join you uh, for this event and especially for this talk. Uh, as Carlos mentioned, I am, I'm, I'm finishing a book now uh, on the Baroque titled uh, Apollo Barroco, um, and, uh, but there's another book in train that I'm working on that comes after that, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today comes from the subsequent book, except for one little piece in the middle which I can't resist sharing with you. 
and I'll announce it in that way when it comes. But um, it, I am uh, the 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 second book, uh, which is untitled, is is um, uh, is an attempt to think about um, uh, the poetry of the hemispheric Americas in a fresh way, and it has a preamble that deals with. Um, uh, the transatlantic. It, it is a book about mostly about the 20th century, um, the long 20th century, late 19th century and 20th. Um, but it has a preamble that deals with um, the colonial period and and connects it to the early modern. And so, so I thought I would um, present what's what basically what happens in that preamble uh, for you today because it's germane to the topic of the conference and. Um, also, when, when Rodrigo invited me um, a long time ago, before the pandemic, to give this talk, he and I had been on a panel uh, organized by uh, uh, Caroline Egan and others at the uh, Renaissance Society of America. And at that panel, I presented a version of this. And I've never presented it anywhere else. I've never published it. I'm, I'm waiting for that book. To, to, to be finished. And so, um, so when he invited me and he said, would you be willing to do something along the lines of the RSA talk? I thought, well, I'll, I will update that and add some more material to it. So that's what I'm doing today. Okay. Every, every poem exists in a zone suspended between two worlds in tension. One, let's call it the poem's original world, is the historical context in which the poem is conceived, which deposits traces of worldview, ideology, an aesthetic program, and concrete elements such as topical references or diction into the body of the poem. The other is the world made by interpretation, in which the reader or critic posits a virtual world according to some principle of integrity or coherence. Now, reason and scruples tell us that these two worlds are distinct from each other. But nonetheless, we court the illusion that under the penumbra of insight and the pressure of argument, we can make them align. If only for the duration of a close reading at the scale of a book, an essay, or even a sentence, Readers obtain satisfaction, and poets obtain readers, from the sense that these two worlds melt into one. Of course, this is impossible. No reading can capture all or most of the traces of the original world in which the poem was conceived. As I said, these traces are the residue of history and the unique events leading to the poem's composition. They are latent. We recover only a few at a time often those that confirm our biases, resonate with other poems we've read, or if we are professional scholars, simply agree with our training. Sometimes our interpretive worlds proceed from an assumed original world that we carry from poem to poem, such as the Siglo de Oro or Elizabethan England. If we're honest with ourselves, however, we acknowledge that Interpretive worlds must be largely remade for every poem, every time we read. If we're prepared to listen, poems tell us a great deal about their original worlds. And the interpretive worlds we fashion must be ready to accommodate that knowledge, however partially. Let me use a personal example that will probably be recognizable to you from your own work. I realized the other day that in three consecutive books, the ones that Carlos mentioned um, that I have written, at some point I discuss the same poem by the Elizabethan poet Philip Sidney, among many others, of course, um, in each book. The same poem, not by design, it just happens that the same poem is discussed in each book. Uh, each argument is different from the others. Uh, the treatment of that poem in any one book could not appear in any of the other books. Naturally, the original world remains the same in all three instances, but my reduction of it is different in each case, producing three distinct interpretive worlds. 
In other words, the interpretive worlds I assemble around that poem by Sidney within each book have more in common with those of other poems, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, French, what have you, discussed in that book than they do with the same poem by Sidney in the other books. And presumably, I could go on treating this poem this way in argument after argument, book after book. From one original world, many interpretive worlds become possible. My three discussions of Sidney's poem render it, in effect, a stranger to itself, something like identical triplets reared in utterly distinct settings. So the project of this talk and of the book from which it comes is to provi provide some terms for thinking about a poetics that crosses languages, political regimes, and oceans, a transatlantic poetics, or perhaps out of deference to the landmark scholarship of Ricardo Padron, Christina Lee, and others, a transoceanic poetics. In an essay published a few years ago titled Inter-American Obversals, uh, you could find this essay in the book called The Lyric Theory Reader, edited by Virginia Jackson and Yopi Prinz. I argued for a new model of long-distance relations that recognizes how shared history may provoke the appearance of corresponding poems at roughly the same time in different places, even when, or especially when, that history looks different according to where the poet stands. That essay, which was the first um, uh, uh, piece of the, of the book that I'm now working on, that was the essay that got me thinking that I wanted to write a book around this, uh, argued for a hemispheric, in the po uh, a hemispheric poetics in the Americas after 1855. Uh, which will be at the center of the case I want to make in the new book, to develop the premise that after 1855, there is hardly an important American poem in the broadest sense, a poem of the Americas, uh, that is not best understood in dialogue with poems elsewhere in the hemisphere. In other words, to break down the nationalism by which we read so much uh, poetry of the Americas. In the introduction to the book, however, I would like to set out some concepts that can illuminate the early modern and colonial periods, for which we need, I think, interpretive models just as urgently. For me, the value of a transoceanic or a hemispheric poetics is that it permits us to see the historical world as such. Poems conceived in Spain, France, England, or the colonial centers of the Americas obviously begin from distinctive original worlds, or so we assume. And yet they often manifest similar preoccupations with the concerns of courtiership, diplomacy, or empire, sometimes in corresponding vocabulary and attitudes. For example, the multivalent ways that 16th century poets treat ausencia or, uh, or the camino as metonymies for experiences held in common by the soldier poet or the diplomat poet of mid-century, uh, mid-16th century. So weighing their likenesses against their differences, I think we may begin to see the contours of these original worlds coming into view, making themselves available to our interpretive worlds that may be applied across languages and cultures. One implication of this approach is that a transoceanic or hemispheric poetry should be understood not as a coherent canon of works or a train of influences, but as a network of distant connections, parallel projects, and cross-cultural doublings. Such a network may become legible through the conventional narratives of literary history. One hopes that um, our usual procedures of literary history are still uh, lively and, and uh, um, efficacious enough that we can we can still use them to talk about the past. We certainly hope so. But I've come to think that um, a network like the one I'm describing it might be best recovered by an approach that looks for coincidences that are highly determined through history, culture, and poetics. So as a model of such an approach, um, and this, is, this argument was originally staged in that piece in the Lyric Theory Reader, uh, I proposed the concept of the obversal. An obversal is a relation between two or more poems that occur in different places 
different cultural situations and perhaps different languages and traditions around a common socio-historical condition or problem. When such an occasion is refracted in poetry, it can produce poems that are obverses of each other. Imagine the two sides of an unstamped coin. Um, faces or surfaces, such as we find on a coin, um, these poems are not opposites or reversals of each other, but alternate versions of a single question or problem. We might think of the obversal as a kind of genre if genres were made from history and not from, not from form or style. A poem caught in an obversal is in some part consubstantial with another poem with which it shares a particular historical situation. Um, when I was first developing this idea and I was um, I gave a couple of talks related to it um, that produced eventually that piece that I mentioned. Um, I used to say very provocatively that what was produced in an obversal were poems that were actually the same poem uh, in different places. That was overly provocative <laughs> because uh, uh, you, uh, you cannot tell a, 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 a community of poetry scholars that any two poems are the same poem, as I learned. And so uh, I've retreated from that position. And, I, and I, I'm interested in a, in a kind of certain degree of, as I say, consubstantiality rather than identity here. And you'll notice my, as I go through, I'm hedging my bets on this point. Um, so a poem caught in obversal is in some way consubstantial with another poem, as I say, with which it shares a particular historical situation. In this, the poems under examination differ in import from poems uh, that we think of as related, say, the conventional ways we think of poems as being related. That is, uh, through sheer contemporaneity or intertextuality or po you know, poems that answer each other openly, right? Um, or, um, or poems that simply share a conventional genre or a mode. Obversals are the outcomes of historical situations seen from different sides with a core element of their original world held in common, such as, and this I think is important, this is what um, establishes the, the definition, such as keywords of more than poetic meaning, that is, think of poems written in different places that share a vocabulary that is perhaps uh, out of legal theological, political language, where the words are almost technical terms and they're brought into poems in that way. So keywords of more than poetic meaning, or they share alike an event of historical import, or they share alike a locale, which is a term I'm using in the strict sense that geographers use it, that is, a setting in which social relations are constituted. <clears throat> Potential obversals might be found in poems whose original world is strongly conditioned by court life under the rule of Charles V or Philip II or in the other countries, Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, Francis I, etc., Charles IX, or poems of Europe or the Americas that develop the enriched semantic, moral, and political charge of words such as oro or esclavo in the later 16th century, or poems addressed to a single figure from several vantages, such as the many poems on the death of monarchs. Or more subtly, Clement Marot's and Edmund Spencer's elegies to Louise of Savoy and eclogues to her son Francis I. So why are these not just poems around a single theme or poems with a common vocabulary? Maybe they are. I can imagine conceding that among the many 16th century poems addressed to Rome, uh, only a subset held together by strict correspondences of vocabulary, event, or locale should be considered obversals to each other, while the rest are merely conventional exercises. For example, mustering Rome as uh, a stock signifier of empire 
but not treating it as the locus of specific, a specific event or observed social relations. While it's always possible to make only a limited claim about their correspondence at the level of theme or diction, I think we ought to envision other possibilities for such poems that would grant poetry the capacity to concern more than itself, to touch history and culture in ways that a stylistic or a formalist criticism rarely acknowledges. I think it also goes without saying that the project I'm describing here um, is also in some serious way about uh, the um, limitations of a historicist criticism and is an attempt to find uh, a new way to do a historicist criticism. And I'm, I can develop that point um, perhaps in conversation later, but, but it's, it's not in the talk, but it's clearly standing behind everything that I'm saying, and I want to acknowledge that. So in obversals, the words, themes, or motifs maintained in common across poems make it possible to reconstruct a concrete fact that extends into several societies and to recover through poetry subjective views of that fact as event, condition, or term. To be direct about it, the raw materials of an obversal are furnished in the language and outlook of a poem, the deposits of its original world. But we critics and readers make the obversal as we gather those deposits into the same poem's interpretive world. And of course, its taking part in an obversal renders the poem's interpretive world larger and more circumstantiated. I suggest that the provision of an obversal makes it possible for us to see the history in poetry, not as something imposed from outside, but as emerging from the inside out, as it were, in language, event, and, and or locale. Now I should mention, here's a little parenthesis, I should mention, but I won't uh, develop here, uh, two concepts in this project that are complementary to the obversal. Then I'm going to come back and talk more about obversals. Um, in contrast to the discrete original worlds of the obversal, um, uh, worlds that are bridged by the kind of concrete details in the poems that I mentioned, I think we also need a term for poems whose artistic and intellectual coincidences are represented by a common spatio-temporal condition. That is, poems that start from the same time and place and divigate outward into the culture. Say, this is, uh, you know, to, to, to mention examples that have come up in the conference and people's talks, um, the, the, how many poems began from the conversation between Navajero and Boscan in 1526, uh, for, you know, from which an entire generation of not only Spanish but European poets learned about Italianate models at one remove or another. You know, that, that is a, to me, that is a divigation outward from a particular concrete historical moment. Or, for example, in 1554, the, the wedding of Philip and Mary, uh, Philip Habsburg and Mary Tudor, what, in which, um, when you look at the, at the record of that event, so many poets were there. Uh, and, and influential people were there, and, um, uh, and so many poems were generated by that event, again, generated outward from that event, um, generated by the occasion, and of course, even poets' persons were generated by that occasion. For example, people such as Philip and Mary Sidney, who were named for Philip and Mary because they were born at the time of the wedding. Uh, and, you know, that event conditioned so much about the next 50, 40, 50 years uh, so I, that's another thing that I think we need a, a way of talking about, and it's what I'm trying to get at with this, these ideas. The poems involved in such a divigation are in most cases very different from each other, more so than in an obversal, because their relation is constituted only through their original proximity in time and space. And then also, if the obversal involves scattered poems that gesture in their own ways to a common socio-historical situation, and the divigation shows poems moving apart after a common origin, what of a third possibility? The poem in which materials of widely different origins converge into a single document, uh, manufacturing a poem that is in yet another way, uh, that in yet another way must be seen relationally in the light of other poems. Now, of course, there's a name for this kind of poem, the cento, 
Um, that is a poem composed out of passages from other poems, such as was often made out of the work of Virgil or, or Petrarch in the Renaissance. A cento, any cento, is a challenge to the critical orthodoxy that would see every poem as a unique integer with an aura of autonomy over it. One of the most, and this is what I said I have to show you from the, 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 my, the book I'm finishing right now, Apollo Barocco, one of the most astonishing uh, centos, I think, of our whole period is this example by uh, uh, somebody who is increasingly seeming to me like my new best friend because I'm spending so much time with him, the Spanish Cistercian polymath Juan Cadamuel. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Cadamuel. He should be much better known. He is the author of a compendious book of the 1660s called the Metametrica, which is a um, I think puts all other, all other examples of the Ars Poetica in the period to shame because it's of its sheer um, uh, ex capaciousness and uh, the unbelievable level of ingenuity with which Cottomwell demonstrates every possible thing that poetry can do. But um, among many other things he does, he has a, uh, uh, a chapter on the Cento in which he describes how poems may be made out of other poems and strongly implies that, as we would say today, all poems are in some sense made out of other poems. The cento to him is therefore only a, a heightened version of something that is in the potential of all poetry. And this one, uh, I just give you an example of what I think is the most impressive of the, of the centos that he talks about. This is his, uh, it is, uh, 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 how to explain it? It is uh, built on half lines, hemi sticks, each half line and separated by the asterisks. Um, each half line comes from a different place in Virgil. Um, and so there'll be a half line from uh, one of the Georgics next to a half line from the Aeneid, next then below that a half line from a Georgic next to a half line, you know, and so on and so on. And uh, I'll just give you the, you know, the quick translation of it. Um, I just gave you the first 10 lines or so. Uh, o seed of a race of gods and conqueror of wild beasts, when you come to battle in camp or field like a thunderbolt, you show, you show the form of an army in yourself. I come to you too, ornament of the age, most holy consort, purer than amber, whose great mind and soul, the immense power of God and Arundel, more about him in a second, belonging to the fates, inspires. O oh, you brightest lights of the world, now your fame is known all over the globe. From here I will begin to sing if my songs can achieve anything. The poem is a tribute to Thomas Howard, Earl of Arundel, who is the great grandson of the poet Henry Howard, the Earl of Surrey, and who at that time was the scion of perhaps the most distinguished Catholic family in England, although Arundel himself converted to Anglicanism. Now, Arundel was better known for connoisseurship than for martial prowess, but nonetheless, the poem, the Cento, complements him as a fierce warrior. Uh, I think that what I find so appealing about this, though, is that um, more, more important than the argument of the Cento is how Cottomwell demonstrates his conviction that even the most canonical poems are merely tissues of possibilities that may be remade to reveal other truths. So the second hemistic of line two, si quando ad prelia ventum est, when you come to the battle, is borrowed from a passage in the third Georgic about breeding horses in which Virgil laments the condition of an aged, worn out stallion who, when he encounters a mare, cannot rise to the occasion. In the Georgic, the analogy between old horses and old men is palpable. What would a dedicatee such as the 50-something Arundel think about this? And of course, Karim Well, I didn't give you this because I reprinted it for you. I, did, I should have given you the, 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 the image of the original page. But Karim Well helpfully puts the citation in the margin of each line so that you can see exactly where it came from in case you don't recognize it. Um, but what would the 50-something Arundel have thought about this uh, when uh, he, I imagine he would scarcely be gratified if he thought that the original retained any traction here. 
the citation uh, indexes, I think, what's really going on here and what makes the, this cento so important and so um, um, powerful for the period is that, uh, that what the citation is indexing, the little thing on the side where he tells you that it's the line from the Georgic, what he's indexing is not just the source, but what it's, it's really a, almost a boast or a kind of uh, uh, a demonstration of power on, on Cottomwell's part, something intangible, that his power to remake even the most famous poems into something fresh and immediate is what he's really demonstrating. Uh, 240 half lines out of antiquity, every half line trailing its own associations, become 120 lines about the present of 1643. And uh, so we mark the themes of the poem, but, but somehow, nonetheless, even as we watch it being made and we see how it was made, the poem falls together, I think, into, into coherence and, and even a kind of beauty. So now that I've expounded the basic uh, principles under which I'm working, I want to turn to a set of materials, uh, poems that uh, present us with some materials out of which we can discern original versus interpretive worlds, as well as the possibilities of, let's just say, of obversals, divagations, and centos. These are a little set that I've assembled of early modern trans-oceanic poems that openly challenge us to locate them in their worlds. And they are a sub, I've identified them as a subset because if we are trying to locate their, put them in their worlds, these are poems that actually use the term world. And in, I would say invite us to assemble a world out of them. So to introduce each one of them by their first lines. Neste mundo é mais rico o que mais rapa. My glorious Lord, how doth the world's bright glory grow great. And familiar to many of you, I think, in perseguir mi mundo que interesas. Together, these first lines of three poems by contemporaneous poets of the colonial Americas stand for a challenge to the literary history of the early modern period, to conceive a transoceanic hemispheric poetics across the colonial sites of North and South America, or in other words, a common project among the Hispanophone, Lusophone, Anglophone, and Francophone poets of the 16th and, century Ameri uh, 16th and 17th century Americas. Uh, we know how to assimilate colonial poetry to its corresponding European traditions, and in certain conventional literary histories, such poetry may, of course, be treated as a branch of the European national literatures. But how can the poetry of, for instance, New England, New Spain, and Brazil be enriched by a comparative reading? How might we weigh likeness and differences together, and in what equilibrium? The colonial period presents its own challenges because while contact among colonial centers within the same empire were frequent and unremarkable, there was little intellectual or artistic exchange across empires and languages. The three, uh, the three quotations here belong to three contemporaneous poets born within 15 years who did not know of each other. Gregorio de Matos, born 1636 a native of Bahia, a lawyer who moved between Portugal and Brazil and became notorious for his mordant verses about the corruption he observed in Brazilian society. Edward Taylor, born 1642, the English-born Massachusetts Puritan who began to write poetry at more or less the same time that he emigrated to New England in his 20s. And of course, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, born 1651 or so, the greatest Spanish-American poet of her time and uh, a genius recognized in both the old and new worlds. Each of these figures obviously is integrated into a national, in the case of Sor Juana, a regional and a transatlantic literary history. And we can also say an entirely different line of approach would be to say that their corpuses can be comprehended according to the transoceanic convention of the Baroque. But that's not what I'm talking about this time. May we convene their poetry into a conversation if we can reconstruct it, a hemispheric poetics of colonial poetry ought to build on the interpretations of the works and careers of Matos, Taylor, and Sor Juana, among others, that have been collected since their own time or after they were rediscovered, in the case of Matos and Taylor in the 19th and 20th centuries, respectively. In other words, it must build on what we already have. At the same time, 
Such a hemispheric poetics should lend new value to those interpretations in the more ample setting of the wider colonial Americas. When these poets and others adopt common forms and genres, when they maintain the same rhetorical or stylistic conventions, and when they somehow engage each other in echo or answer, we should be able to attend to those moments in their poems with the critical insight born out of comparison. For colonial poetry, as I've said, our understanding of a hemispheric poetics must account for the conditions of the period. There's the fact that in the 16th and 17th centuries, the colonial centers in Brazil, New England, and Mexico may seem more unlike each other than they would be in the following centuries, notably in light of the differences in political and ecclesiastical institutions and the discourses on the agendas of these centers. In the 1670s, across the three places, to take three cases that we often observe discreetly, we might find one community preoccupied with survival in a territory in which um, uh, European whites were surrounded by indigenous tribes, while elsewhere another community discusses the rights of the Creole population, and a third is debating the corruption of the clergy. Even the landscapes were strikingly different in nature and in cultivation. Comparing Spanish America and the English settlements along the Atlantic, the late J.H. Eliot has written that, quote, the Spaniards were faced with jungles, mountain ranges, and deserts, which made William Bradford's hideous and desolate wilderness of New England look like a Garden of Eden by comparison. <laughs> Besides the conventional observation that English settlers or planters in the Americas were interested in commerce while their Spanish counterparts chose conquest, Eliot notes that the, the Spaniards sought vassals while the Englishmen sought land, that the Spanish notion of civilization was embodied in cities while the English maintained a rural society of at least two distinct characters, great estates widely separated in the Virginia and Chesapeake regions and small towns close together in Massachusetts. And above all, that the Spanish lived in close proximity to the Indians by design while the English established their settlements up to a point beyond which lay wilderness. That point, of course, is the Pale or the Palo. Uh, which is you know, why so many settlements have a name like pa Palo Alto or something where there's a, a tree that marks the end of the settlement. A poetics we might recognize through these conditions must struggle with, obviously, with incommensurability or the sense that these societies are simply too different in too many contingent ways to speak to each other in poetry. And isolation, the profound separation of the poets from each other, and even from their counterparts in the metropoles of Europe and England, um, the latter complaint is, is, is prevalent enough to be a commonplace in the verse of the period. Even as the colonial centers seem to lack the common historical conditions and widely exchanged discourses that will bring a hemispheric poetics to light in later periods, however, this era is characterized by something else an attention to the elemental facts of an American world newly observed and inhabited by Europeans, most of all its peoples and landscapes. The poems record this new world in the fresh sense of that term, when it really was a new term, uh, cl closely through attitudes, vocabulary, and even rhetorical gestures that are manifestly held in common across languages and societies, even without historical events or context to serve as conduits. One such attitude, for example, is a wonder at the contrast between the here of the poem and a there variously imagined as Spain, Portugal, England, heaven, or some other place that appears inaccessible from an American perspective. One of the most recognizable sonnets of Gregorio de Matos voices the attitude, Triste Bahia, o qual de semelhante estás e estou do nosso antigo estado. Pobre te vejo a ti, a mi empenado. Rica te vejo el ja, tu a mi abundante. Probably only a few years later, Edward Taylor writes the following meditation in which we see the attitude again, even when the values are utterly different. Methinks I spy Almighty holding in his hand the crystal sky and sun in it bright, making all sunshine day heavenward abound. The spiritual world this world doth lord outvie, its sky this crystal lantern doth or match, its sun thou art that in its bright canopy outshines that candle darkness doth dispatch. <laughs>
One poem laments northeastern Brazil's enthrallment to the Máquina Mercante that enforces its difference from Portugal and from its past condition of self-ruled abundance, what he calls Noso Antigo Estado. The other poem notices what is dissimilar or outvied or, or matched between earth and heaven and observes a different abounding, that of heavenly in contrast to earthly light. Both poems go on to record an American reality removed from a then and there in which, to which comparison is impossible. And while Taylor's meditation is saturated, as always, with anticipations of God's will, oh, bright, bright day, Lord, let this sunshine flow, even the reprobate Matos concludes his sonnet with an ironic tryst, twist, an ironic wish that, oh, si quisera Deus, a new dawn of austerity will see Bahians shake off their worldly ways with their, with their cotton capes. Reading comparatively, we see in both poems an attitude that sees the American present as beyond comparison and envisions an uncorrupted past or future. A skein of words and ideas in common support the attitude, the words that appear in both poems, world, abundance, dawn, day, may God, something. While the foundation of both poems is the notion of incommensurability between here and there. Perhaps even the rhetorical gesture of the apostrophe to God, inviting a new day at the climax of each poem, O oh, si quisera Deus, and O oh, bright, bright day, Lord, let the sunshine flow, belongs to this expression of attitude through verbal pattern. At the same time, within these contours, Matus's and Taylor's poems are vastly different from each other, as different as Bahia is from Massachusetts at the end of the 17th century. One poet is a rebel to the established order who rants against Bahia's captivity to international trade and the shifts in values that follow from that condition, while the other is a Calvinist preacher who looks to God to enlighten the world. One composes acute satires, while the other overflows with metaphysical meditations. Matos and Taylor might seem to have nothing in common except their contemporaneity and their writing in colonial outposts until the provision of a hemispheric poetics encourages us, us to retrieve the likenesses in their poetry that will in turn permit us to weigh the differences. For this po period, I argue, such a poetics is found in, as I said in obversals, uh, uh, out worldview, attitudes, vocabulary, and rhetoric developed in parallel, materials which, um, taken uh, together, give us the capacity to assemble uh, an obversal. Without a hemispheric poetics to assemble likeness against a cross current of difference, not only are these poems entirely different, but they have no conversation. We know as a staple of conventional literary history that colonial poems converse with their European counterparts in the same languages, bringing them together across the hemisphere. We reimagine the colonial past and rediscover how poetry then was made. So to open the last episode of the talk for the last five minutes or so, um, uh, I chose three passages from Matos, Taylor, and Sor Juana that posit a speaker's relation to the world because I wanted to suggest that in such statements in poems we often find these stances that reveal a hemispheric poetics at work. That word world often marks the spot at which a poet must commit to an observation of the little and the large, the granular uh, and, and its uh, granular life and its farthest horizon and, and must commit to representing these things against one another. A proper inventory of such elements would include the topoi and tropes that populate colonial poems across the hemisphere, the genres brought from Europe and how they become transformed in New World writing, and the seemingly spontaneous rhetorical flourishes, such as, for example, the apostrophe that I mentioned um, in the two foregoing poems, but also other rhetorical um, um, tropes such as hyperbaton and aposiopesis that may express wonder, horror, and other feelings toward American experience as these poets encountered it. In the conversation that I've been staging here then, and what I've really been doing, I hope you can see, is, is, is give you, show you the raw materials out of which we then might imagine. Could we make an obversal out of this? Could the, do, what do we have the terms for getting these poems talking to each other according to our conventional methods? Or should we be thinking about fresh concepts that might help us to do this? In the course of this conversation that I've been staging, I think, and, and I've got, I'm going to give myself five more minutes, it will be impossible not to give Sor Juana Ines 
the last word. Her sonnet in tribute to the Austrian astronomer Father Eusebio Francisco Kino, the sonnet that begins, Aunque es clara del cielo la luz pura, concerns a local matter, the, uh, namely the dispute between Kino and Carlos Siguenza y Gongora over the significance of the great comet of 1680. Uh, Anna Moore has written about this in her book, Baroque Sovereignty, and I, if you don't know that discussion, I recommend it to you. But Kino's uh, treatise on the phenomenon, the Exposición Astronómica del Cometa, published in Mexico City in 1681, is an important landmark in New World science. When we look past its local import, however, Sor Juana's sonnet belongs in conversation not only with Kino and Sigüenza y Góngora, but with Taylor's aforementioned poem about God's heavenly light. How so? Poems are composed about 25 years apart, his after hers. He was nine years older, and Taylor outlived Sor Juana by tw more than 20 years. But if, an, if a transoceanic poetics can be found in this period, it may depend not on one poem literally answering another in historical time, but on factitious conversations through attitudes and other features. Sor Juana begins, uh, her sonnet begins as though in reply to Taylor. Aunque es clara del cielo, la luz pura, clara la luna y clara las estrellas, and goes on to affirm that heavenly light cannot dispel the shadows of human conocimiento. Only a sovereign natural philosopher such as Kino les vio a las luces, luces celestiales. Inspired by the interpretation of a comet, Sor Juana's sonnet might be said to converse with Taylor's meditation to assert the value of human understanding, which is implicitly demonstrated but nowhere celebrated in his poem. The presence of that value in her poem brings out the absence of that value in his poem. Starting from their respective faiths, they disagree. As inquisitive as any of their contemporaries, Taylor has looked through a telescope, as he remarks in a meditation of the 1680s, I kenning through astronomy divine the world's bright battlement. But the nature of his devotional poems is to conclude with a reflection, uh, not on human capacities, but on God's power and mercy. He always does this. Where poems are as contiguous as these two, however, with one seeming to answer the other uh, directly or indirectly, we might look again at Taylor's meditation and ask, might the occasions of these poems correspond even if they do not coincide? Do the poems belong to an obversal held together by more than common language? In the bright lanterns, lanthorns, as he says, of the heavens, could Taylor be witnessing and interpreting a comet? It happens that just as Juana's sonnet dates to about 1681, when the, her, the keynote treatise on the comet of 1680 was published, Taylor's meditation was composed in 1705, the year in which Edmund Halley's Astronomiae Cometicae Synopsis, perhaps the most influential book on comets, appeared in print and was acquired by the library at Harvard College. Perhaps two extraordinary events mediated through books ripple beneath the surface of two poems about 25 years apart, neither of which includes the word comet, uh, and provokes these poems alike to take their respective positions on the astronomy of earthly, heavenly and earthly light. Perhaps reading these poems in likeness and difference, we can know more about their worlds and about poetry itself than we ever can by keeping them apart. So to conclude, one more minute. Um, I think you see what I'm trying to do, and I hope that it resonates with what some of you are doing. I believe it does from having heard many of your talks. Um, uh, I'm trying to expand the, what I'm calling the original historical world of poems and the corresponding interpretive worlds that we make by connecting one original world to another and connecting one interpretive world to another um, rather than keeping them discrete. I think that the common elements revealed in this way do not um, uh, obscure or efface the differences, but on the contrary, they make the differences work for us by helping us to um, use the differences to bring out likenesses to help us to understand, I think, what is really historical about these poems versus, for example, what is merely rhetorical or what is merely conventional. Um, in other words, as poems lend historical meaning to one another, we exchange, uh, we exchange and enlarge their worlds, uh, and so one hopes uh, understand the past as well as poetry itself. Thank you. <laughs>